I'm Es Devlin, this is my interview. What I make are, are sculptural portraits. In the case of Adele, she, like many actresses and performers of Greek ritual, employs a mask. If you meet Adele in the street, she does not look like the person you saw on the photograph of the show. She doesn't have those eyelashes. She doesn't have that line of black above her eyes. She has two voices. She has the voice that she speaks with, that she would talk to you with right now and tell you a story with, which she also uses in the show. And then she has the voice of this persona, the person who sings, the person who has the eyes. The point of that design was to really draw the audience's attention to the disparity and the ebbing, flowing connection between those two very distinct people that we're working with. My process is always a series of things. All the drawings I do are generally not one thing, but the same thing turning or flipping. And the other thing I loved when I was growing up was gadgets. I loved things that could flip open and flap open, do 25 different things. So I think that's persisted as well, the idea of what could this do? What else could it do? Uh, how many ways can it speak? How many orifices literally can it spew through? Uh, how many ways can it modulate the voice? Musicians, people who work with music, are used to working with a medium that has no concrete matter. The extraordinary thing about music is that you can, until the moment it leaves your throat, change it. It's malleable up until the moment it's come out. And then you could sing it next time differently. It is the antithesis of what I work with, which is matter, which is steel and concrete and trucks and schedules. So that meeting between ideas and physical forms is, is the area that I work in, in, in all sorts of ways. So really whether the singer, the artist that I'm collaborating with has a strong visual sense or, or not, in general, their prime meeting is with music and with the malleability of that. And therefore, I try to stay with all the materials, all the physical concrete objects I deal with, I try to keep them as malleable, as long as possible, to stay in parallel with the process of the music. Well, I've been working with Kanye since 2005. By the time we got to Jesus in 2013, there had been a, a, a language that had evolved. And as you rightly suggest, a very powerful voice that really will iterate and iterate until it finds the right sculpture to, to house it. The most innovative take on theater, because you thought of it one night while you were sitting on top of Watch the Throne set, which you designed with Ez Devlin. And I designed the set with Ed's Devlin and I thought of, okay, surround vision. It should be a screen above you, below you, to the left or the right, right of you, and in front of you also. And in that particular case, uh, Kanye had been striving to bring nature onto the stage. He has a great affinity with nature. Animals, the sky, the rocks, the sea. If, if, if he had his way, they would just be here. We would take the lid off. We would transplant the whole thing to Epidaurus and it would happen, you know, in a Greek theatre where you look out over nature. But the logistics determined that it's going to happen in a sporting arena. So the idea of building a mountain was very much his way of bridging that divide. The mountain itself, there were many, many iterations and the final version really was Kanye's. I think in the end, that final mountain, uh, Kanye had picked some bits out of the dustbin that had been rejected earlier in the day and he pieced them together and that mountain was really resurrected from the bin. Well, I've got a bit of a bee in my bonnet about the word client. So um, I, I tend to not have any. I've got collaborators, though. My basic rule is that I'm always as interested in someone else's idea. Uh, and I don't think there is a bad idea that can't be turned into a good one, actually. There are bad ideas. Of course, there are terrible ideas. But I think they can you know, be like grits in oysters, can't they? They can be beneficial to make you question what you thought was a fluid. There's a quote from, uh, I think it's uh, Saul Bellow, who says, it's always the falsest contrivances that you're proudest of. So when you feel really proud, and it's come really smooth, that's often when it's, uh, it needs to be reconsidered. I don't really know, uh, ever feel like anything's a success. And I think that's really normal. I think also when you're dealing with the number of collaborators and parameters that I genuinely deal with, it can never be an unleaky vessel. 
there's always going to be a leak. There's always going to be a bit where you go, oh, if only that could have been tidier, or only that could have been like this, or if we could have, you know, got this through the budget or whatever. I mean, it's been said before, but the Samuel Beckett thing is very uh, apt. The fail again and fail better is just failing better. Fail better, just fail better. <laughs>